let me know. Give me the thumbs up. All right. Well, good evening, everybody. Sorry for the slight late start. Um, so we are going to just pick up where we left off yesterday, but we will open with prayer, um, you know, per uh, Albert's good reminder last week. And so let's go ahead and pray, and then I'll remind us what we talked about last time, and then we'll jump into um, what we're going to cover today. Lord God, we just thank you so much that we are able to come together and we're able to talk about church history. Um, and we're still talking about an introduction to history itself and really an introduction to church history. And I just pray that uh, you would be with us and uh, we would get the most out of this, Lord. And, and it just helped me uh, teach truth. Um, and Lord, we just pray all this to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so last time, as we were talking about church history, um, pretty much... Um, I went over, like, why study church history? Like, why are we even here? If this wasn't important, I wouldn't be wasting my time with this, okay? So there were 10 reasons why we should study church history. And then I went over the complex uh, discussion of defining history because it's not as easy to define as you might think it is, okay? So we went over that. Then we went into basic historiography. Um, you know, the various views of history. Is it cyclical? Is it linear? Is it progressive? Is it like conflict history, like the Marxists would say? We went into the various uh, deterministic approaches, like geographical determinism, theological determinism, um, economic determin determinism, and all that good stuff. And so hopefully you vaguely remember all that, um, because it, as I mentioned before, it's really an eclectic blend of all of these. All of these are right in a way, but there is one ring that rules them all, okay? And the one ring that rules them all is linear history and theological determinism. But it will, it will make use of the other ones. Um, and so the last thing we talked about, if I remember, is we talked about um, pretty much how the best way for you to learn, or pretty much the levels of progress if you're a learner or if you're going to be a writer. And so I'm going to bring that back up because I brought some books to kind of um, show this off a bit. Um, but pretty much this was the slide that, uh, that we looked at last time. And s simply put, for those who are just going to be learners, you've got level one, level two, level three of this. For the first level, you start with a course like this. It gives you an overview. And then you're going to read books, like introductory books that give you an overview. And then the second level is maybe you'll focus in on an era or an individual. So you'll look at biographies or maybe you'll study a denomination. Um, you know, things like that. And then the third level is where you start reading the primary sources themselves. You know, rather than reading about Augustine, you read Augustine. And what are you going to read? Confessions, City of God, on Christian teaching, Essentials for the Christian Faith, all these things. He wrote a lot, okay? Um, and so you start reading what he wrote. And then now you could actually say you get Augustine. Um, until you've got to the third level, understand you're just a student. Shouldn't be teaching anybody, okay? Um, because third level is where you're actually reading these people themselves and, and, and you understand what they said, what they believed. Now, some people want to take it to the next level and they want to be historians. And historians are people who write history. And so that first level is the third level for the learner. You're starting with the primary sources, digging deep in those. And then the second level is you go back to secondary sources, but you're going to the secondary sources of like PhD scholars. PhDs writing for other PhDs. It gets uh, pretty complex, but they're the ones looking at the primary sources in the same depth you did, maybe even more so. They've been doing it longer, and so you get some of their insights. And then the third level, you synthesize it all and you start writing it. Now, in this class, that's not what we're going to be doing. But pretty much, uh, just to kind of illustrate it for you, first level, second level, third level for the learner, right? So on that first level, as you could see, these are just basic uh, history books that give you a general overview of church history. And then the second level, that's an example of a biography, okay? The, the Matizo Augustine. It was a, a particular, very unique biography on Augustine that was very helpful. And then that third level, that's 32 volumes. Um, it's the, it's the anti-Nicene volumes, the Nicene and the post-Nicene volumes of church history. And pretty much what it covers is most of what was written in the first 800 years of Christianity. I have all these in my library, um, and I've had to consult them many times for papers. And so I brought some stuff in. So if you're starting with level one, this is a basic um, church history book. It'll take you from the beginning up to 1500. It's the 
History of Christianity by Huso Gonzalez. Um, and of course, you have Bruce Shelley who wrote one. You have um, uh, Needham, like in the 2000 Years of Christ's Power. Instead of writing one book, he wrote, I think, five. I have the first four. Um, but the point is, these are all introductory level. So if you want to have your basic grasp of what happened in church history, you start here and you start with a class like this. If you want to take it up a notch, then maybe you do biographies. This is a biography on Abraham Kuyper. Um, I read this last year. I like this guy. He fascinates me. But to understand him, you also got to understand Christianity in the Netherlands in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Um, and so reading this biography gave me a good picture of not only this man, but the Christianity of his society. Or this one is, is, is a fun one. This is just a history of a seminary, the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, one of my alma maters. And pretty much what you get through this book is a telling of the history of our denomination, the Southern Baptist Convention, but you're getting it through the lens of its flagship seminary. So you read this book, you're not just learning about the seminary. You're learning about the Southern Baptist denomination and everything that's happened in the last 120, 130 years. Uh, maybe you would like to uh, narrow it down a little more. And this is 19th century evangelical theology. What did evangelicals in mainly England and America, what was going on in the 1800s? It's very focused, okay? But it's still a secondary source. You're not reading primary sources, but you're going to know more than the person who just reads the Needham books or the, the Gonzalez book, right? So it takes a deeper dive, and that's what the second level is all about. One more second level one. Um, this would be churches, revolutions, and empires. This is focusing on church history in Europe between the French Revolution and World War I. Um, a very, very unique time in history. And so... What, how did it affect the churches? So again, it's a deep dive, but it's still secondary source. You're not, you know, reading the primary sources. Now, the third level is the primary sources. So you look at that, that picture there where it has those 32 volumes. This is the first one. Again, I wasn't going to carry all 32 in here just to prove that I have them. You could come check it out in my office anytime. But can anybody think of a, a limitation maybe uh, in terms of me calling this a primary source? Anybody want to throw it out there? It's not fake and it's not too long. It is in English. Very small print. That's another one. It's in English, right? So for it to be a true, true primary source, so take this, the Apostolic Fathers. This book right here covers probably a third of what's in that one I just showed you, but it's in Greek, what they actually wrote in. So if you're going to get really, really into the primary sources, you're going to read it in the language itself. If you can't, then a translation will do. At least you're reading a translation of what these, these folks wrote. Um, but yeah, that gives you an idea of, of if you want to become a lot more proficient in church history, this is how you do it. Like anything else, you start with the simple stuff, you start broad, you get a nice big level understanding, and then you start narrowing it down. There's going to be a part of church history that, that you like. Me, I kind of like the early stuff. I like the patristics is what we call it. Those are the, the church writers probably from the second century all the way up to around the time of Augustine, maybe a little after. I don't know if Maximus the Confessor counts as patristic or not. I'd have to look that up again. Um, it's interesting. He's named Maximus the Confessor, but his tongue was chopped out for uh, his Christianity. So he confessed in a very interesting way, but he couldn't... Now he's probably like, okay, I'm not going to make a joke at Maximus' expense like that, although I just did. Okay, so, um, but pretty much I like the early church. I like knowing uh, what was going on when the Roman Empire was still living and breathing in a sense and how Christianity uh, interacted there. But some people are like, you know what, I'm interested and I'm interested in what's going on right now. Or some people might be interested in the Reformation. Seems uh, people who come to Reformed doctrine get obsessed with the Reformation and they want to read all these biographies and, and stuff and that's good. Um, so the thing is, you start broad, you narrow down, and if you really want to be a, a gangster at this kind of stuff, then you get into the primary sources, okay? And so I just wanted to, to share that. And so now as we continue, I want to move into uh, what I call basic historical housekeeping. Um, what I want to do is I want to cover things that really, um, if you don't know these things, you're going to get confused when you hear dates, and, and, and certain vocabulary. Um, 
So simply put, you need to understand the difference between B.C. and A.D. If you think B.C. means before Christ, you're right. If you think A.D. means after death, you couldn't be more wrong. Because then that would mean we have a 33-year gap called zero. And that's not the way it works. A.D. stands for Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. And so the idea is the B.C. are all the years before Christ. And then you get to the year he was born. Hence, it's called the year of our Lord 1. Okay? Now, I'm going to break it to you. Those dates are wrong. They're off by about four years. But that's what it means. Okay? And so when you look at our dating system, and the entire Western civilization uses this dating system now, it means everything before the year AD 1 counts backward, okay? So pretty much it counts backward. So if you look at like 3000 BC, that's farther away from, but like that's actually 5,000 years ago, if you get what I'm saying. And so then it starts counting down until you get to the year one, and then it starts counting forward after that. Now, that's all stuff you learned in elementary school, but it still confuses people a lot. Okay, so you got to understand that. Also, when you're writing, if you're ever writing this, not like I'm giving you tests, but there's going to be some people who will take this course and they will have to write. If you're using the BC AD terminology, you always write BC after the numeric date, but you write AD before it. It would be incorrect to say the year 50 AD. The correct thing is to say AD 50, year of our Lord 50. It's actually incorrect to do it the other way. Now, since most people do it wrong, when I'm preaching, I do it wrong as well, so they don't think I'm saying 80 and then another number, because AD sounds like the number 80. But the point is, when you're writing it, make sure you put the AD first. Now, secular folks use a different rendering, BCE and CE. Okay? BCE just refers to before common era. CE refers to common era. Why the change? Well, not everybody's a Christian, and we find it offensive to say year of our Lord. But I laugh at this only because the years are still based on when he was allegedly born. So we don't believe in him, but we're going to count our calendar off of this man's life. Changing initials doesn't change anything. But if you're ever going to write anything, and you're going to write BCE or CE, in some academic papers you have to, um, both of those go after the number. Okay, So you won't put CE before the number. Both BCE and CE go after the number. Okay. So that's just how we render the dating. Okay. Now, why do we keep time this way? When did this happen? It's kind of like everything has a history, right? And so um, we do this because a 5th century Scythian monk that lived in Italy named Dionysus Exegus came up with this system around the year 525, maybe a little bit before that, AD 525, right? And so with the sources available to him, what he was trying to figure out is how many years after the foundation of Rome was Christ born. And so he calculated it down to what we now call AD 1. Now he was off by about four to five years. How do we know that? King Herod died in 4 BC, okay? And if King Herod died in 4 BC, but King Herod tried to kill baby Jesus, then baby Jesus was born before this 6th century monk said he was. Okay? And so I remember when uh, my first year in college, somebody tried to say, the Bible's uh, incorrect. I'm like, how do you know? Like, because Herod died in 4 BC, four years before Jesus was born. It's a very ignorant claim. The Bible doesn't say he was born in 1 AD. The Bible says he was born in the days of King Herod. That's what it says. Okay, this dating system came from a guy six centuries later. And honestly, only being four to five years off, he wasn't that, that's not that bad. I think, you know, give the guy some credit. He had candlelight and some parchment, and he was only off by four years when he's making this calculation 525 years later. And just to let you know, this took a long time to catch on. Okay, not everybody readily accepted it. The famous Venerable Bede from uh, the British Isles, um, in the 8th century, he rejected this. He's like, I'm not going to use it. And then the next century, you have this famous German monk, Regino of Prim. In the 9th century, he also rejected it. Most of Europe did not come on board until the 11th century, and Spain was the last holdout. They didn't come on board until the 14th century. So just understand, at various points of history, Christians were not using this dating system. A lot of them used a different system called indiction, which in my opinion is more complicated, but they liked it. And if you want to know how indiction works, they broke up history into 15-year tax periods. 
And so you would have a 15 year period and then within that period they would say it was this year within that period. And if you want to know how to calculate in an addiction, you take any given year, so let's say you're taking the year 800, you add 3 to it, 803, you divide it by 15, okay? And whatever that number is, that's addiction number whatever, okay? And so, so let's pick an easier number, um, what, the year uh, 300, okay? Then you go 303. Okay, well, what is 15 divided into 300? Anybody know off the top of their head? I think it's like 60, right? Yeah, 60, okay, <laughs> just making sure this is being recorded. Okay, so if you take the year three, so if you take the year 300, but you add three to it, so 303 divided by 15, you'd be in the 60th indiction third year. That's how a lot of them like to count time until this replaced it. I prefer this a lot more than indiction. <laughs> so love it or hate it, this is better than what we had before. Now the Jews tell us, hey, we're way too complicated. Just use their calendar. They're in the year 5,700 and something, if I remember right. I should know. I'm Jewish. This is pathetic that I can't remember what Jewish year it is. But uh, they just count forward without splitting things uh, at, the, at the birth of Christ. Now, one more housekeeping thing that I have to mention. Centuries. Okay? This has always confused my students that they'd say, why is 1980 the 20th century? It's 1980. Shouldn't it be the 19th century? And then I'm like, I really want you to think about this before I insult you. No, I never said that. But I want you to think about this for a second. And, and let me just state this first. 801, 9th century. 1980, 20th century. Year 64, 1st century. Exceptions would be the even number year when a century ends. 100, 200, 300, 1900. Those would still be like 1st century, 2nd century. So let me explain this. Rachel is 19 years old. Okay? But she's in her 20th year. She's not in her 19th year. She completed her 19th year. Okay? So on her birthday, she completed 19 years. So on the day of her birthday, it is still her 19th year, but she's completed it. The next day, even though she's 19 years old, she is now in her 20th year. Okay? And so she's moving day by day in that 20th year until her next birthday. And then when she's completed 20 years, she's now 20. And then the next day, even though she's 20, she's in her 21st year. It is the same thing with centuries. When you get to the year 100, you've completed the first century, but you would still call it the first century, 100, because it's now completed. But the very next day, <laughs> you are now in the second century, okay? So that's why, here's what you just got to keep in mind. Whenever you say a year, just go the next number up. So if you're like 1783, and I'm like, what century? 18th. Okay? The only exception is if you're saying 1700. If at that point you say 18th century, I'd be like, nope, you weren't listening. Okay, so 1700, then yes, it's the 17th century still. 1701, you're in the 18th century. Does that all make sense? That way when, like, for example, when I said uh, Dionysus was a 6th century monk, and you're looking, but it says 525. 25 years into the 6th century. Okay, so hopefully it all makes sense now. Okay, so with that housekeeping done, I would like to move into the nature of church history. We've been talking about the nature of history, but now we need to jump into the nature of church history, okay? And as I mentioned before, we are going to approach this course as theological determinists that believe in linear history. That is the one ring to rule them all in this course when we're approaching history, because we think it would be absolutely foolish to believe this is all random, and yet here we are, I'm using words that everybody understands. We're on the same page as anything but random. Okay, so randomness cannot be the guiding principle of reality, but God is. Okay, so we're theological determinists that believe in linear history. Now, secular historians today, they tend to reject theological determinism and they lean on social or economic um, determinism. Okay, um, so the thing is, you know, Marxists, there's not a lot of them anymore, um, but Marxist intellectuals will think economics is what leads everything. Um, I think what's more common is the social scientists. Social sciences right now seems to be uh, the queen in a lot of, a lot of universities. Okay? But we're going to take a biblical approach, and a biblical approach says money, social issues, psychological issues, geographical issues, those all play a role. 
okay? But there's a sovereign God that superintends all of these things. There's a God who's in control of history. Uh, I know it's cliche and it sounds kind of lame. It only works in English, just to let you know, but they'll say that uh, history is his story. Now, that's not what the word history means. Remember, it's the Greek word historia, but if it helps you understand the biblical position, then yes, think history, his story. God is the one guiding and leading it towards its end. Now, those who only teach social history, they actually end up missing the whole picture, okay? Uh, and that's why I think good Christian historians give you the whole picture. And what I mean by that is, remember, I was trained in a secular institution. My first four degrees come from secular schools. And I got a bachelor degree in history from Cal State San Bernardino, took a lot of upper division courses, loved every bit of it, learned a lot of historiography there, okay? Later, I go to seminary and I have to take church history classes. I have to read church history books. And honestly, I was seeing that the Christian historians were taking into account everything that I learned from the secular folks, but they were able to tie it together better and not leave certain pieces out, where in the secular academy, this particular historian's running with this angle to the exclusion of all other angles. And then another historian counters him, which one's right? And really, I've seen with my own eyes how the Christian approach is the one ring that unifies them all. Um, not everybody could say that because if you've only been trained in a Christian institution, then you just have to assume that, uh, that they're telling history in a, in a more efficient way or better way. But I could tell you, I've read too many books from both. And I like the Christian approach. It makes the most sense. It takes into account the evidence. And so that's pretty much, uh, you know, the, the direction we're taking it here. Now, a little more on the nature of church history. We have to remember that Christianity is a historical faith. Not every religion, in fact, most religions are not a historical faith. And, and I'll explain that in, in a minute. But talking about Christianity being a historical faith, um, our source is divine revelation, the Bible, okay? Um, but it was written mostly as history. Genesis, Exodus, the Gospels, Acts. About half the Bible is historical narrative. And then the prophets fit within that historical narrative. You're able to, to take the prophets and put them within certain parts, let's say in 1 Kings. You know, you read Isaiah, he tells you when he was a prophet. He prophesied during the reigns of Uzziah and certain kings, right? Ahaz, Isaiah. And so then you go read first or second kings, and then you realize, oh, this is when Isaiah was prophesying. And so when Kings tells us this stuff was happening, then we see Isaiah write these 66 chapters, and it's all put in that context. The point is, all of it's being presented as if it really happened. None of it's being presented as myth. Um, if it was myth, then we might as well throw it all out because it's presenting itself as if it's the truth. And if you think about what the fundamental claim of the gospel is, it's that God invaded history by becoming a baby in the womb of a virgin, being born, doing what none of us could ever do, live a perfect sinless life, and then die in our place on the cross to take our penalty, and then rose on the third day. Those are all massive historical claims, okay? Massive historical claims. If it didn't happen, then Christianity is a farce. You know, you might as well go live your meaningless life and, and, you know, eat, get fat, and die because there is nothing else out there that means anything, okay? Um, but the biblical claim is that God has invaded history, okay? And then the Bible gives us historical indicators like Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, in the days of Herod. It's, it's asking you to take that serious, that there was a man named Herod and there was a time when he reigned. Or Luke chapter, um, chapter 1, verse 5, same thing in the days of Herod. Or chapter 2, uh, verse 2, um, Quirinius was the governor. Or chapter 3, verse 1, in the 15th year of Tiberius, the emperor. These were real people. You could look them up. You could find when they reigned. Okay? And so the scripture is definitely presenting itself as if it happened in history. Okay? Now, church history, so this is when we get beyond the Bible, Church history is the recognition that our God is a God who interacts in history. It's what he does. We see it in the Bible, but we also see it after the biblical era. There's a lot of things that happen in church history that make it very clear to me that God is still always in control of it. His hand is on the steering wheel. Okay, When things got really corrupt and the Roman Catholic uh, Church took things in a 
a, a direction that is just, for lack of a better term, uh, very unbiblical in the high Middle Ages, you then have the course correction called what? The Protestant Reformation. But when the Protestant Reformation then uh, weds itself to the state in a way where they start persecuting those who disagree with them and burning people when that's something that Christians should not be doing, then you ended up with Baptists as a course correction of that, right? So the Lord raises up people with the Bible who sets his people on the right direction. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, you, you clearly see that God is a God who interacts in history. By the way, Genesis chapter 1, verse 14 tells us that God gave us means of keeping time with the stars, the moon, all that kind of stuff. You know, you do understand it's with the sun that we keep track of years, right? And even before that, it was with the moon, okay? But we keep track of time based on these, these objects that God made, and they were made for that purpose. Why keep track of time if we're not supposed to keep track of what happens in time? Okay, so we're supposed to be historical people with an interest in history. And I even think of all the times in the Old Testament, God keeps telling the Israelites, teach your children what happened so that they, future generations, may remember. It's always about remembering what happened in the past so that we know how to live in the present. So anyway, yeah, God intervened in history many times to accomplish his will. Um, and so really church history then is defined as the study as the study of what God has done in the life of the church, okay? So that's the nature of church history. It's what happened, it's how Jesus builds his church over the course of time. And our God, just like with the Bible, he records the, the failures and really just the blemishes of his people. There is a lot in church history that we have to be ashamed of. Just like when you read the Bible, there was a lot to be ashamed of in Noah, in Abraham, in Moses, in Israel, and even in the early church, there's only one in whom there we are to not be ashamed of. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Perfect man Jesus, right? But, but yeah, church history is filled with uh, just bad stuff. Um, as, a, as a Jewish believer in Christ, I am saddened over the anti-Semitism and the legacy of anti-Semitism in the church. I love the fact that Michael Brown, another Jewish believer, wrote a book that is titled, We Have Blood on Our Hands. And so it's important for us with the Bible to um, really uh, acknowledge those failures so that they're not repeated again. In America, what is, our, what is our, our big sin in America that goes back to the beginning? Slavery. But there was a lot of Christians who were okay with it. We don't cover those blemishes up. We look at them and we deal with them. Okay. So nature of church history, now we move to the sources of church history. Where do we find this stuff? In other words, how do you know that I'm not just making stuff up and I just said, hey, what, what lies am I going to tell them today? i got to come up with an hour's worth before they get here. No, like, and, and the people who write these books, where are they getting their information? Okay? It's not that they're just making it up. There's, there's sources for this. And so um, I kind of list them out here for you, okay? Many sources. One thing you can look up is church histories, and I'll talk a little bit about those later on this slide. Um, but church histories, there were some early Christians who decided we're going to write a history of the church from the beginning up to this point. And so they, they brought together all the documents they still had back then. I mean, if you think about it, you know, time kills a lot of documents. A lot of things don't survive. So if you have somebody in the fifth century compiling everything that he could get his hands on from the first three to four centuries, and he's synthesizing it, that's, you want to take a look at that. Okay, because a lot of those documents have not survived to this day. Okay? So Christian histories are helpful. Letters from Christians to other churches. I mean, we have letters like from a guy named Clement uh, who wrote to the Corinthians. You know how early Clement wrote that? In the year 95. John the Apostle was still alive. And we have a letter from a Christian leader to an, in Rome to a church in Corinth. And you can read it. I remember the first time I read it, I'm like, that's what an elder's like? Because... The elders that I was sitting under at that time were weak compared to this guy. I'm like, 2,000 years ago, that's an elder. These guys I'm sitting under, they're, uh, it's like the Three Stooges or Keystone Cops. You know, but I'm, and I, never mind. Forgive me, God. I was just very disappointed. Let's put it that way. Um, so about 20 years later, you have the letters of Ignatius, or about 15 years later. Ignatius was a famous martyr. He wrote a lot of letters to a lot of churches on his way in chains to Rome, to be killed in the Colosseum. 
Um, and so that gives you a good source, and that's kind of what you're figuring out. What was the, the church like, um, you know, in the, in, around the year 110, okay? Um, you also have apologies, not like, oh, I'm sorry, but you had Christian philosophers writing defenses. Uh, apologies here comes from the word apologia, which means defense. It's like a court defense. You had some very intelligent Christians writing apologetic um, defenses of Christianity to Roman emperors, saying, you need to stop killing us. We're not that bad. You know, we pay our taxes. You know, we pray for our leaders. You know, we're taking care of the poor, all that kind of stuff. And then they would give, like, the proof and evidence of that time um, that, you know, Christ Christianity is true and the Bible's true. Prophecy is fulfilled. People are spreading rumors about us. We don't actually eat babies during the Eucharist, you know. They had to tell them that because those were the, the rumors that the pagans were spreading, okay. Um, you also have polemical uh, books like Irenaeus in the late, so around the 180s, started writing against the heresies of the time. Heresies started multiplying. So guess what he, what he titled that work? Against heresies. And he pretty much dealt with a lot of them. And what's fascinating is he, he brought up, this one just caught my attention about 15 years ago. Um, you had this archaeological discovery of the Gospel of Judas, right? It was this Gnostic work that's being presented and discovered, and it's like, oh, there's another side to Christianity that the institutional church isn't telling us about, that there's a gospel from the perspective of Judas, you know, the guy who betrayed Jesus. And the interesting thing is, Irenaeus told us about it, 1800 years ago and he even quoted most of it and when you look at his quote because he quotes it to then refute it and when you look at his quotation of it and his refutation of it and then you go read this thing that was dug out of the ground it's almost exactly the same and so who's covering up anything the church from the beginning has acknowledged these works are out there it's telling us why they're wrong okay so you have polemical interest polemics deals with uh you know the the refutation of false ideas um, you have the decisions of councils, like the Council of Nicaea or the Council of Chalcedon, and then they write creeds. And based on those creeds, we, we see what the church uh, doctrinally was stating at that time and where they were drawing the line, that if you don't believe this, you're not a Christian, okay? And then you have private letters between Christians. Um, so you got a lot of that stuff. But it's not just church sources in the ancient world. you got secular sources. Um, one that I had to read when I was in college um, was uh, Pliny the Younger's letter to Emperor Trajan um, because during Trajan's reign they were killing Christians. Pliny was a governor and he was rounding Christians up and killing them and eventually he's like why are we doing this? Because after he tortured them he's like you know here's what I found out. They worship a guy named Christ. They wake up real early to worship him. They share most of what they have with the poor. Um, they're actually not that bad. So what do you want me to do? And then, then Trajan wrote back to him and said, all right, if they're not that bad, don't go and hunt them down. But if you happen to arrest one and he won't deny the faith, kill that one, you know, but you don't have to go kill them all. Uh, but that's a very fascinating, fascinating document where this guy's saying, after I've tortured them, this is what I've learned about them. And really it tells us what their early worship services were like and what they did. Um, so yeah, and, and then you also have the pagan histories of Tacitus and Suetonius and Dio Cassius. Um, you have the, the history of Josephus, his, his major works, War of the Jews, the Antiquity of the Jews. I got a lot of this stuff in my office if you guys ever want to borrow this stuff. But if you do, I'm watching you because I've had people borrow my books and then I've never seen them again. Um, but anyway, and so you got the writings of pagan philosophers, all that kind of stuff, right? So a lot of good stuff. Um, where we learn a lot of what we say about this. Now, Christians started trying to write church histories as early as the second century, but none of them survived, unfortunately. Uh, the first that we know about was a guy named uh, Hagisip Hagis Hagisipius, sorry, Hagisipius, but his history didn't survive. The first one we have, the most notable one, was Eusebius of Caesarea. And I've got his as well, and I was going to bring it in. Well, actually, I got a picture of it right there. So Eusebius. Um, I don't, you can't agree with everything he wrote. Modern historians have proved where he's embellished and exaggerated, but a lot of it's pretty, pretty good, okay? And so, again, he was writing in the, the fourth century. You have a, a secular pagan historian, also from the fourth century, named Socrates, not to be confused with the Socrates you're thinking of. That Socrates never wrote anything. Only Plato wrote about Socrates, but this is a Socrates way later who also wrote his own version of church history, you know, from a secular perspective. 
Um, and so point with all this is Jesus promised to build his church in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, and we trust him to fulfill the promise. And so church history is the record of what he's done. And where we find that record is in a lot of writings. OK, you go to the writings because those were the people who were there who are leaving the records. But then we take some of those things I was talking about last week, you know, some of the things we know about economics now, some of the things we know um, from the social science sciences and it does help us interpret what happened okay like you know when you take a uh, church history part two and you get to the protestant reformations there's this really big event called the german peasant revolt and martin luther took the side of the government to kill the peasants who revolted now a lot of church histories in the past frame that whole event in terms of theology it was just people rebelling against authority but, you know, more modern historians look at it and say, look, these people were really being cheated. They were starving and there were certain promises that weren't being kept. And so a lot of the cause was economic. And they thought that Martin Luther was somebody that they could rally behind because if he was pressing it back against Rome's corruption, then maybe he'll press back against the corruption of the Germanic princes. Um, but he didn't. He didn't. And so that's one of the, the disappointing things. But there's, there's a lot of insight that we're able to add to the sources that we have from that time, okay? Now, the next thing I wanna talk about, and this is pretty much the last thing before we wrap up, but there's, there's a bit to say here, is Christians and church history throughout history. <laughs> and I know that's a tongue twister because I said history a lot, um, but pretty much throughout different eras, Christian thinkers have tried to look at the story of the church and they've seen it through their own set of eyes. And they haven't always been on the same page. So really what I want to tell you, like, for example, if you could jump in a time machine after taking this class and you go back to various eras of church history and say, this is how we should understand church history, they're not going to agree with you. And then you're, they're going to say, who's to blame for this? And you'll be like, Feinstein. And then, uh, you know, well, again, it's a thought experiment. You can't really make a time machine. But every era is going to look at history really through their, their own prejudices and, and their own thinking of the time. So really what I want to do is, is go through those eras really quickly. Um, in the patristic era, which refers to the early church, you have two opposing views. Okay, The first view is comes from Eusebius, that guy I was just telling you about, and it's called imperial theology. Okay, Imperial theology. Now what does imperial make you think of besides Star Wars? What, what, what is that word, what is that word, uh, what's it in reference back to? Kings. Kings, but even more than that, emperors empires okay this is the theology of the roman empire after it became christian okay so or star wars right so constantine becomes a christian makes christianity legal he is not the one who makes it the sole religion of rome people say that they're wrong all constantine did is make it legal it's about 60 years later that theodosius makes it the sole religion of rome and then after him julian puts paganism back, and then after him, Christianity comes back. All Constantine did was make Christianity legal. But what he did is he married the church and state together. Um, and, and so now you had a lot of, and we'll talk about this when we get there, but this is when a lot of corruption seeped into the church because if you wanted to be in government, you had to be a Christian. So now you got a lot of people who aren't even Christians saying they're Christians so that they could get these state jobs so that they can make money. Right. That that's why the marriage of church and state always corrupts the, the church. It just does. You know, the, the problem is like today's secularists frame it as if there's too much religious involvement in the state, the church corrupts the state. No, history proves it's the other way around. The state corrupts the church, not the church corrupting the state. OK. And so pretty much what Eusebius, though, he was all with this program. Constantine's the man. He's the man of the hour. God picked him. I mean, Constantine declared himself to be the 13th apostle. And again, Eusebius is just like, you know, and yet Constantine barely even knew what was in the Bible. And he went back and forth on very important issues like the Trinity. Okay. But Eusebius's imperial theology said, look, God was with Constantine because Constantine was with God. So, and because Constantine was with God and now the empire's with God, God is now with the empire. So it reduced everything down to if you, if you do good, then God will bless you. Now, the next century, you have Augustine, and he has a very different view. He ended up rejecting this. He imposed imperial theology, and it is found in the book City of God. Amazing book. There are good English translations out there. 
every Christian who's serious about the past should read it because this guy is probably in the top three thinkers in Christian history and probably in the top eight thinkers in all of history, period. Uh, yes, Frank, I normally don't take questions, but I'll take this one real quick. Yes, and so Pastor Brian is doing a study through the city of God with people who are, it's like one uh, Thursday per month. Um, everybody's, yeah, the first Thursday of the month, uh, people are reading the city of God together and doing uh, questions together. And it, it really, it, it is so worthwhile, okay? Now, pretty much what Augustine said is that God does not award anyone on the basis of merit, but it's always on the basis of, of grace, right? It's built on grace, okay? And so the church's greatest um, moments, he says, is when you had the worst emperors in power. When you had the greatest persecutors, that's when God did the most work. So you can't say that we need the emperor, emperor on our side. You can't say that we need Rome. Instead, Augustine says history is so much better than that, that what you have is you have the city of God, okay, God's people, from the very beginning that's on its course. But then you have the earthly city, the city of man. And pretty much we who are of the city of God, we are pilgrims within the earthly city, within the city of man. We're to be salt. We're to be light. Sometimes we influence the city of man to such a point where the city of man takes on our morals and all that type of stuff, but the city of man is never the city of God. So even a Christian Rome is not the city of God, okay? It's going to be corrupt. Things are going to go wrong, and eventually it's going to fall. And Augustine had to write this because the Roman Empire did fall. And so then people are like, well, the world must be ending. And he's like, the church is not the Roman Empire, okay? He had to help wash people's brains away from Eusebius's imperial theology, okay? And he was able to show, really, like this was a, an ancient Christian version of critical theory of how with the Bible you were able to be critical of the structures and beliefs of pagan society. And boy, in the first like 10 books within the city of God, he just makes them seem really stupid. Um, he uses sarcasm, wit, but most importantly of all, he uses sound logic and shows how the whole pagan project doesn't work and why we need the Christian project, right? And how it should affect everything like art, science, history, all that stuff, things that we're now kind of rediscovering. Uh, we call it, uh, what, what do we call it? Retrieval is what uh, people call it today. And so Augustine did a, a fantastic job on that. And he said, listen, the city of man and the city of God are going to be duking it out till the end, okay? And so Augustine, I think, probably has the best view of church history ever. And I'm going to bring up a more recent version of this um, before we close. But when we get to the Middle Ages, because the Middle Ages loved Augustine, but they mutated him, okay? They mutated his city of God idea and almost married it with an imperial uh, theology idea and really what they, what they said is they identified the city of God as the visible institutional church, okay? So the, the church wasn't just the people of the city, the church was the city itself. And in the Middle Ages, you had the papacy. You had the Roman Catholic Church as really the institution that also um, ruled the governments, okay? And so kings got um, coronated by who? Popes. Who declared Charlemagne to be the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire? Who crowned him? It was the Pope, okay? And so when you define the city of God as the institutional church, where you're looking at brick and mortar buildings and you're looking at popes and bishops or metropolitan bishops and then bishops and priests and deacons, and that's what you're saying is the city of God, then you're missing Augustine's point. Um, and so when you get to, to um, the, the late uh, medieval Christendom, they said, man, the golden age was in the Middle Ages. And then, of course, when you get to the Protestant Reformation and then you get to the Catholic Counter-Reformation, they still look to the Middle Ages as the golden ages. Those stinking Protestants ruined everything for us. Um, we would look at it and say, no, that needed to happen because a lot of corrupt stuff happened in that medieval church, um, and it was because of their mutation of the city of God approach. So then you get to the Renaissance era, um, 15th and 16th centuries, and uh, you end up with more critical methods. I, I mentioned how there was an upgrade to history at this time. And you end up with some secular histories that get produced. Um, and I, I think I mentioned with Lorenzo Valla how he exposed uh, a major forgery in the Middle Ages called the Donation of Constantine. Um, and we may get to that by the end of this course. I'll, I'll say a little more about that. Okay. 
Then you get to, uh, and so the, the difference between Renaissance church history and Middle Ages church history is the Renaissance history had a more critical eye. They were willing to question the narrative. I, I guess you could say they weren't revisionists, but they weren't taking the party line um, for granted. They're saying, this is what the Pope says. Let's test it by what we could, what we could find out through investigation. And it did uh, put a crack in the Catholic church narrative, which I think helped the Reformation. A lot of people say that the Reformation would not have happened if not for the Renaissance and the printing press. And I think they're absolutely right because you could take Martin Luther and you could compare him to a guy from a century before named Jan Hus or John Hus, if you're going to anglicize his name. But, but Jan Hus taught the, almost the exact same things as Martin Luther and he got burned and killed for it. And yet when Martin Luther does it, it spreads like wildfire all over Europe. Something was different a hundred years later. Printing press and pretty much the damage to the Catholic Church that was done by some of the Renaissance humanists. And so, um, so yeah, like all, that, all that's at play here. But when we come to the Reformation era, their view of history morphed into what's called the confessional view of history. And pretty much what they did is they ended up, um, oh, I've been on the wrong side. Pretty much what they did is they, um, is church history was viewed through the confessional belief of each Protestant group. Okay, so, so the Lutherans, it's kind of interesting how the Lutherans would do it. They would say church history was good until you get to scholasticism in the 1200s. And then once that, it's all garbage. Now, the Anabaptists who came out of it, they said, no, anything after the year 150 is garbage. We don't trust any church history, you know. And uh, the Restoration uh, movement in the 1800s did the same thing. Typical Protestants coming from the, the Calvinist sectors said, no, you could find good stuff throughout all of church history. And they found a way to resource guys like Aquinas, some major Catholics. They, would, they say you could chew the meat and spit out the bones. And so they had a more favorable view of history. But all of these groups made the history line up with their confession. So the good history is what lines up with our confession. The stuff to spit out is what doesn't line up with our confession. And I think that's great for theology, that's great for confessions, that's great for creeds, but that's not good for history because now you're telling history in a way where it's less interested in what really happened and more focused on what should happen. Um, and so, again, that ends up not being the, the, the best way to do it. Now, when we move to the 17th and 18th centuries, you're going to end up with two opposing views, okay? Again, just like you had two opposing views in the early church. Okay, and so what are those opposing views? Well, first you have Protestant orthodoxy. They doubled down on the confessional approach and got even more close-minded with it in some respects. Okay, um, but then you have as a foil to them the Enlightenment movement of the 18th century, and the Enlightenment. We'll talk about that when I, if I ever teach a Church History Two class, which I plan on, but I don't know if I'm going to do it right after the Church History One class. I might do something else before then. Don't know yet. Um, but anyhow, the Enlightenment really um, was a rejection of, of Christianity in favor of, um, instead of the Trinity, it's more of a deistic God. Instead of a personal God that intervenes and, and cares about what happens in history, it's more of like the blind watchmaker. He sets everything up, uh, and then he kind of leaves, and history's just going to be what it is without him. Um, and so because of that, if God's not the center, man is the center. If God's not the foundation of truth, we're the foundation of truth. And so because of that, you, you really end up with this critical spirit where reason, human reason, is elevated above divine revelation. Okay? And so from that, they, they start questioning just about everything. They say, let's treat the Bible as if it's a human book. And then from that standpoint, they start dissecting it in ways that actually doesn't make sense. I mean, if you were to do what they did with any book, you would be able to make any book seem like it was written by 10 different people, even if you could prove it was written by one person. Um, it, was, it was very, very interesting. And so most people don't hold to this anymore. But this was the start of what would lead to Protestant literal, uh, liberalism, you know, and, and, and all that kind of stuff. And then once you displace God and you make humans as the center, at first you have people like just in an idolatrous love with human reason. But then you get the romantic movement, which has nothing to do with swinging through a window with a rose in your mouth and handing your love chocolates. That's not, you know, what the, what the word means. The, the romantic movement was more of a rejection of the Enlightenment movement. The Enlightenment movement centered human reason. Romanticism centered really nature, the mystery. Um, you know, there, there's things outside of us, bigger than us, but it still wasn't God, right? And then after that, you end up with, with Marxism, um, 
you know, materialistic nihilism, uh, psychology, uh, social sciences, and, and you just have a, a million different things now trying to hold the center. And none of them can hold the center. But whatever view you have at the center is going to dictate how you see history. Okay? It really is. If you're looking at it from a Marxist standpoint, all of history is the oppression of the proletariat by the bourgeoisie. Okay? And once the proletariat gets class consciousness, it overthrows the bourgeoisie, and we end up in a new synthesis, which becomes a new thesis, which then will be challenged by a later antithesis, like I was talking about um, last week. And so, again, or if you're going to uh, take, let's say, Freudianism, 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 and you make that your center, man, everything is about sex. Everything with that guy. Um, and so it's just, it's, I'm not going to go into some of those things, but everything ends up being reduced down to that. Whether we're talking about wars or economic trans uh, um, transactions, everything comes back down to that. So again, whatever you hold as the center is going to dictate what you see as the gut or the grand unifying theory of, of history and everything else. Now, when you move to the 19th century, um, Christians start holding an optimistic view. Um, so those, those 32 volumes of church history were edited by Philip Schaff. And so one reason you could get those 32 volumes about 10 years ago for 300 bucks is because they're 100 years old. You know, if you're going to get the newer stuff, you're not going to get 32 volumes of, you know, words so small that you need a magnifying glass. You're not going to get that for so cheap. Uh, but by the way, you can't find that series anymore for the price I got it for. So you thieve from me, I'm coming. I'm coming. No, I'm just kidding. Um, well, no, I'm not. But um, Philip Schaff, the editor of that series, since he was a theologian of the 19th century, which would be what set of years? 19th century would be the what hundreds? 1800s. Very good, right? They had a very optimistic type of view of the church, um, that they were post-millennialists, which means they believed that we are going to usher in the millennium ourselves. It's not through Christ returning. It's through the work of the church. And this was when you had like the advance of the modern evangelical missions of movement. Um, movement. And so they believed what we were entering into was a golden age, that you were going to have a golden age where Christianity was going to unify all corners of the earth, and you'll have a global Christian society. And then after some amount of time, Jesus would return. They clearly rejected Augustine's uh, view that the city of God and the city of man will duke it out till the end. But then we get to the 20th century, and there's a reason very few people hold that optimistic view of the 19th century, and that's because you had World War I, you had um, the Great Depression, you had World War II, and you've had who knows how many genocides between then and now. And so you could look at any point after World War I, and you could say Christianity has not provided a global unity that was being predicted in the, um, you know, in the 19th century. Now, of course, those of us who hold a more Augustinian approach says, yeah, duh, the Bible never says we're going to unite the world. The world gets united when Jesus breaks into history a second time, okay? And so it makes sense what we're seeing. But, uh, you know, it was, there was this book, Four Views of the Millennium. Um, and this guy, Lorraine Botner, Dr. Botner, wrote this big chapter defending the post-millennial view that we will unite the world. And then George Ladd, you know, because these other scholars get to write like a 10-page rebuttal. He wrote a one-paragraph rebuttal. He said, World War I, Great Depression, World War II, Holocaust, need I go on? <laughs> that was his reputation. Things are not getting better. They're only getting worse. Um, and so, yeah, you, you pretty much have that, that older optimistic view displaced in the secular academy. They start, again, opting for all these different unifying theories. And so in the 1950s, what you start to see is you end up with feminine and black studies as it relates to church history. So they start asking questions of history um, that, that they say history as it's been told is told only through the perspective of the white male. Okay? And so because of that, you can't trust it. And so now you need to look at it through the eyes of minorities and women. And inherently, there's nothing wrong with that. Getting more eyes to look at something is good because perspectives do get missed. But this wasn't as simple as they were making it sound. They were already coming at it with a Marxist agenda. So you had a Marxist worldview framing their critique of 
uh, church history. So it became completely revisionist and it had the agenda of overthrowing structures and, and all that kind of stuff, the cultural hegemony, so that they could make their new society where uh, power and all that kind of stuff is, is, is changed. So at the end of the day, you can't expect that their history is going to be an accurate telling of the history because it's history with a goal. Okay, it's history to, to change the minds of people. And of course, we've seen the Nazis do that. Okay? We've seen the communists do that in Russia. When, when somebody retells history in a way that serves their own purposes and they try to force re-educate people on it, you end up with mass graves. You end up with mass grave sites. You end up with a lot of people dead. Okay, so the liberation theology is not a good way of going about it, but a lot of liberal Christians have jumped into this. And so uh, uh, James Cone, I have his book up there. Um, you know, he was the father of black liberation theology, which again is a Marxist project, retelling history through that lens, and it denies very clear biblical positions on Christology, um, theology proper. I mean, you read him, the man was not a real believer, not by any means, but he uses Christian vocabulary. And you got a lot of different liberation theologies. And again, those would come up in church history too, um, whenever I get to that. And then after the liberation theologies, once you get to like the 70s, 80s, and 90s, um, you start to get this, uh, how many of you are familiar with the Da Vinci Code? Um, the Da Vinci Code, it was all the rage like, what, 15 years ago? People who are still making videos refuting it, they're very late to the party. But you had this author named Dan Brown, a popular author, who took this scholarship from the 90s and put it in this thriller where it turns out that, like, you had a, a diversity of Christianity that was run by women and, 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 you know, it was women worship and nature worship and all that kind of stuff. But you had the evil Christianity of Paul. And you had these different Christianities waging war with each other. But once Constantine picked Paul's version of Christianity, they suppressed all these other ones. And then, because Constantine wanted to unify uh, Christianity, there was a vote, like making Jesus God came down to a vote at the, the Council of Nicaea, that church, Christians didn't believe Jesus was God, but then it came to a vote like it's a democracy. Now we believe he's God, and that's where our, our doctrine of the Trinity came from. And again, that's all malarkey. It's malarkey. You could read, again, all those sources that I mentioned from the late 1st century, early 2nd century, 3rd century. You could see what the church believed about these things. Okay, You could see what they believed, but you ended up with uh, revisionist scholars like Elaine Pagels, um, who more or less she tried to push this idea that Gnostic Christianity was the real Christianity that got suppressed by the, the government of Rome. But that's not the case. When Irenaeus wrote against heresies, he was writing against all these when Christianity was a persecuted religion, when it was an illegal religion. There was no power dynamic there. It was the powerless who were writing against these heresies. Okay, So again, the actual record disproves them, but the record doesn't mean anything to these people. When somebody has an agenda, their agenda is what matters, not the truth. And so again, Pagels was just trying to make us question the whole narrative and go back to what? A more pagan nature worship um, religion and call it Christianity. So my point is, when you dive into history and, and you look at the various views out there and, and how people are um, telling the history, hopefully as you get more educated on this, you don't fall for the malarkey because there is malarkey out there. There are agendas out there, okay? Now, the 21st century, who knows what it's going to be like. But here's my prediction. It's going to be more global because even right now, the majority of Christians in the world are in Africa and Asia. They're not in the West anymore. And they're now starting to write their own theologies. I've read some uh, pretty interesting stuff. I got a book called uh, Trinity Through Asian Eyes, um, which is kind of interesting. Like, imagine if Christianity started in China rather than in the Roman Empire. What would be the, the, the words and the vocabulary that they would use to explain the Trinity? Um, it's different than what you get out of, uh, you know, the Roman Empire, where they're, you know, steeped in Platonism. So you're going to have a very Platonic vocabulary. But uh, in China, it would have been uh, very Confucian, uh, not confused, but Confucian after Confucius. And it, doesn't, and it doesn't mean that it's a blend of Confucianism with Christianity, just like it wasn't a blend with, of Plato with Christianity. It's just using the words available to explain these biblical concepts. And so my guess is that we're going to see a, a much more holistic, like global, globalistic, not in a conspiracy theory bad way, but I'm talking about of like real 
Orthodox, Bible-believing Christians are going to be telling history in, 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 a, in a, I think, a more full way. Uh, Kevin Van Hooser wrote a, f a wonderful article on that. Um, but there still needs to be the one ring to rule them all. And, um, and he thinks the one ring to rule them all is the cre uh, creeds and confessions of the Trinity of Christology, um, you know, and, and all that good stuff. But we'll see what happens. Um, so anyhow, the last thing, and then we'll be done, is how is this course going to be arranged? Because we are now done with the introduction. Um, the outline is, is pretty simple. I'm going to divide it into five sections. We're going to have an introduction which is not what we're doing now. This was an introduction to history. The introduction is we're going to focus on the foundations of the church from 4 B.C. to 100. Okay, So there's going to be quite a few lessons covering that period to get us to the year 100. And then after that, we'll move to the patristic era, which is being titled Persecution from Pagan Domination. We're going to focus more less on the theology, although the theology will be there, but more on just how the church was being hunted. They were trying to push the church into extinction, but it grew. Now, 325 is when that ends, because that's when Constantine declares Christianity to be a legal religion. So then the next phase is the institutional church, the marriage of church and state, and that covers the years 325 to 1054. It's a pretty big chunk. And then in 1054, anybody know what happened? The East and Western churches split. Okay, so you had the Eastern Orthodox, and then the Roman Catholics go their separate ways. And so then our focus is going to turn more to the West, and we'll focus on papal domination, which covers the years 1054 to 1215, where the Pope solidifies more and more power. And then we, the next unit is we talk about the collapse of that power over the course of time, the collapse of pa uh, papal prestige. It'll cover the years 1215 to 1517. Anybody know what happened in 1517? Reformation, Martin Luther, right? And so that, that's the, like the, the culmination of the decline of, of papal prestige. Now, in each era, we will discuss the main men, women, movements, theories, writings, and events that took place. And then you will have a good overview, church history, up to 1517. You'll have an idea of who were the main players were, um, what happened. And so then you would know which areas you might want to do a deeper dive on. You'll know which part of this interested you the most. If you were fascinated in the early stuff, but bored stiff in the Catholic stuff, then you know that you're somebody who probably likes early church things. But if you love the Middle Ages, then um, you're going to get along with Brian, Pastor Brian, very well, and because he loves the Middle Ages as well, and he loves uh, um, reading, uh, reading a lot of the sources from that. And so, yeah, pretty much that's uh, how the course will be outlined. And so, in conclusion, in conclusion, church history is a blessing to those who know and understand it. Ignorance of church history causes people to repeat the mistakes of the past, and it will also make you be stumbled when dialoguing with Roman Catholic Church or folks and Eastern Orthodox Church or heretics or atheists. When you see a Catholic bumper sticker that says, Jesus Christ uh, has been our pastor for 2,000 years, you'll be able to look at that and just shake your head and say, nah, uh you guys didn't actually exist until the year 590. You know, and so, and then you would be able to prove it. And then you'd be able to show them how um, really they've bought into a lie. That's just not true. Peter wasn't the first pope. Actually, the first written name of a bishop of Rome, his name was Linus. Not to be confused with uh, Charlie Brown's friend, but, uh, but the, the point is, you know, history does a good job exposing people's lies. And so that's why this will so serve an apologetic purpose. Um, and it's our duty to use the intellect that God gave us, not just to know the Bible, but also the history of his people. So I'm going to end this where we're going to go next time. Okay, the next lesson, and it's probably going to take me two lectures as well, is the intertestamental period. Um, so it's still before church history, but you need to know this to know church history. If you read the Old Testament, it's all Hebrew, a little bit of Aramaic. The whole New Testament's written in Greek. Where in the world did Greek come from? You're reading about these Romans who nailed Jesus to the cross. Who in the world were the Romans? Where are these and Sadducees and Zealots? Who are these guys, you know? Um, and so the point is the intertestamental period pretty much builds the world for us so that when we open the pages of the New Testament where the church is born, we understand the world that we're looking at. And then from there, we take a rocket ship all the way to 1517, okay? So with that, Rachel's going to stop this. You remember how? All right, and then I'll take questions.